first presenters for Spirit Day are Vladimir Slante and Jared Sanderson. With more than 10 years experience as a therapist, Vladimir Slante, LCSW, has made an invaluable impact on the Kansas City community through his work as a social worker, crisis clinician, and a children's book author. As a committed equality advocate, Sante is a member of the BIPOC community, while also providing counseling support to not only children, but their families and the broader community through a holistic partnership. Sante graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and a Master of Social Work from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He currently works at Truman Behavioral Health as a team lead. Jared is a listener leader, influencer, difference maker, and solution builder with the history of successful organization transformation and change man management. Jared combines his education and background in direct service with his desire to help nonprofit organizations operate at the highest level. His nonprofit experience expands 15 plus years across sectors that include clinical counseling, housing and youth, family and senior services. He has led social service departments and programs through change heavy processes such as downsizing, program merger, rapid upscale and disaster response business continuity. He also provides consulting services to help organizations develop an environmentally and culture, excuse me, an environment and culture that supports this thinking and practice. Jared is a licensed clinical social worker and is certified in social impact strategies by the Colorado Institute for Social Impact. He has facilitated workshops in the area of self-care, full inclusion, effective altruism, and conflict resolution. Jared and Vladimir are presenting Vital Conversations, Creating Space for Inclusion. Hello, we have a lot to get to. So we are just going to jump right in. Um, I do just want to bring attention to how weird it is to be able to see my face while I'm talking to people. <laughs> Uh, if you think about the, the last person you talked to this morning, if you talked to anybody, imagine a hologram of your head on their shoulder while you were talking to them and how strange that is. Uh, so if you see me staring off into space, I'm probably looking at the glare off of my head uh, because it's uh, I'm really self-conscious about that. So uh, anyhow, uh, we are going to dive right in. There's a whole bunch to get to uh, when it comes to this topic. And um, it's just it's it's sometimes difficult to get as much as we can into this space. So, um, we're going to be talking about vital conversations, uh, ways to create space for race equity. Um, I'm going to start and then I'm going to pass it over to Vlad to take us home. So uh, if at any point you can't hear or something's going on, please let our hosts know and they will let us know. We will speak up. Yes, and we will pick up our voices. So um, let's get right into this. Some housekeeping first. Uh, when we start talking about the frameworks that we're going to offer uh, for this workshop, uh, I do want to just cover some basic parameters uh, to get us off and running. Um, we are going to get into some deep water relatively quickly. Uh, forewarning, there is one video that has a curse word in it. <laughs> so we're all adults. Uh, I think you'll see how this curse word actually has context for the topic. Uh, but just heads up, uh, we are going to get into some pretty deep stuff pretty quickly. And then we're going to come back out and um, have some conversation around frameworks to help us deal with uh, what can otherwise be difficult conversations. So um, some basic background understanding. First, individual experiences and community realities are really important to recognize here. Uh, we all have individual experiences um, that mean everything to us. And it very well may be the case that we've all experienced situations where we felt like we were in the minority at a given group, or we felt like we were being mistreated. Um, that is different in periodic episodes than it is living in that space 24 seven all the time. Um, so when we start talking about different experiences for different people, it is by no means an attempt to diminish what your individual experience may have been. Uh, it's just important to recognize that it is different um, and it is going to be different based on each one of those individual experiences. So they're still yours to hold and they're still important, uh, but we also need to focus on the community at large and how those differences manifest. Um, the history does matter here. Uh, we really can have a productive conversation if we agree to acknowledge a baseline history. Um, it is just the case uh, that there have been different treatments of different people throughout uh, the United States history in our country and that that has an impact today. So if we can agree on that, um, then we can have a conversation from there about what that impact is. But I think it's just important to recognize that there is a baseline history and that history is different based on the experience that different people have had. So um, discussions of privilege do not have to be taken personally. I think it's just important to recognize this. 
uh, I'm a white male. Um, I have a name that generally identifies me as a white male for most people. Uh, that doesn't mean that the things on my resume I didn't work for. It doesn't mean that I didn't work hard for those things. It doesn't mean that I have a good pronouncing number. Um, it does mean potentially that my hard work was more likely to be recognized and honored uh, because of the culture that I have. So that in no way diminishes the work that I did. Uh, it's no way an attack on me. Uh, but I think it is important to just recognize that there are those numerical instances of, of benefit or privilege that you may not ever feel. And in fact, you probably won't feel it if you are the person benefiting. <laughs> so um, just being able to talk about this without taking it personally, I think is really, really important. Uh, the last piece to remember here is this isn't just about race. Um, it, every demographic that we tend to group each other by, uh, these same principles fit. Uh, we're gonna talk about race because it's kind of the most front and center. And when we talk about race, it's not just black or white, but we're gonna use that as kind of our example as we move forward. Um, but this really is, these principles really do apply everywhere. Um, so it's just important to remember that. We're gonna talk about this in one specific instance uh, for most of this, but all of these concepts track every direction. Uh, I should also add that I know I talk fast and I can't stop. So uh, just be aware, <laughs> I've tried, I've tried to slow down and it's just not going to happen. Uh, you're lucky that I'm have to sit for this because I would be moving the whole time too. Uh, so one of those two problems is alleviated just by having to sit down. So um, we're gonna dive in. We're gonna start with an activity. Uh, this is just kind of a fun uh, intro into this idea that we're gonna introduce as a framework to think about these things. So I'm gonna play an audio clip. It's actually gonna be two audio clips. It'll be about two minutes combined. While you're listening to this person, uh, I want you to think about what you think this person looks like. Uh, this is just a phenomenon of our brains. When we hear a voice, we typically assign a face to it, even if we don't know it, who it is that's speaking. So if you have pen and paper and you actually wanna draw this, you can. If you just wanna capture it in your head, you can. Uh, but we're gonna play this and uh, just picture who it is you think is speaking here. That, that's a perfect summary of my argument. And, you know, it, some people could be skeptical if you ask them about responses to my ideas and keep them more responsive. Well, maybe you're right. We're going to do about it. We're, we're always going to be captured by our emotions and our gut feelings. But maybe if I'm more optimistic, I'm going to be optimistic or not going to give them the observation. We're biased to favor our own. Even in many cases, we're the first one to be in favor. What does that mean? Just to close my eyes and say we're stuck with it. So it's not so easy to get turned on that when the crisis is the only way we can engage the crisis. That's the thing. We can set our tactical beliefs on our side, like blind feeling, or a coincidence that an earlier idea of the way we are going to take the decision about the crisis. Okay, it sounds like maybe people couldn't hear that. <laughs> if you couldn't hear it, that's okay, uh, because the basic idea, you've probably had this experience where you've listened to a podcast or you've listened to somebody on the radio and you get this image in your head of what you think that person's lo person looks like and then you actually see that person um, and it turns out it doesn't look like anybody that you thought it did. Um, so I had this experience with the speaker that we were attempting to play there. Um, if you couldn't hear it, then that's okay because um, I've done this with several people, a couple hundred. This is the speaker. And this is just a few examples of what people thought that that speaker looked like. Um, so this should be instructive in some way right out of the gate um, that it is the same speaker saying the same thing and so many different people have a different idea of who that person is. So how does that happen? How is it that we can have so drastically different ideals and understandings about the exact same circumstance? I don't know if anybody's heard of Danny Kahneman. Um, he is an economist and a psychologist, uh, a Nobel Prize winning one. And he introduced this concept in the early 2000s of system one and system two thinking. Um, system one is automatic response. So most of our interactions every day, we're in autopilot. Uh, we are basically just responding out of the full scope of our past experiences being projected onto today. 
And that's 95 to 98% of our behaviors and actions in a given day. And there's a utility to this. Uh, imagine if you stopped and did a cost benefit analysis this morning about whether to have tea or coffee, um, or rather to say hi to someone or wave hi, or to just not say anything to that person. Um, if we tried to take the time to analyze every single decision that we make throughout a day, it would be exhausting and we wouldn't get anything done. Uh, so system one responses are really important to be able to move quickly throughout um, life generally. System two is a more slowed down deliberate effort uh, where we actually stop, we question that initial reaction and consider the implications uh, one way or the other. Uh, we do that about two to 5% of the time. So most of our day we're on autopilot. It's just past experiences uh, loading in real time onto the surface of what we're seeing today. Uh, which is why people see somebody different when they hear that voice, uh, because all their past experiences with somebody saying something like that or somebody who sounds like that just floods the zone. And there really isn't a stopping point where you step back and think, does the person really look like that? So that seems simple enough. Uh, I think most people can recognize the difference between system one and system two response, uh, but it really is crucial when it comes to creating space for race equity. Uh, because a lot of the conversations that we have in the space right now are happening in system one responses, those automatic responses, and aren't happening in the system two effortful um, response. And so another way to think about this is um, system one is first reactions, again, fast, automatic, impulsive, um, unconscious processing, so very limbic system based. So you can see the benefits here is that it allows for quick decision-making, but it's also error-prone. System two takes longer, but it's more reliable. Um, we're gonna stop for a second. Your first code word is together. So first code word is together. We're gonna try another video here. Hopefully this uh, can be heard. Uh, this is another way to understand system one and system two response. And we're gonna talk about this in terms of familiar and unfamiliar feelings. Okay, it sounds like we still aren't getting sound. So we're gonna take one second and try to fix this because it's really important that we do get sound. All right, we're going to try this one more time. Our brain is hardwired to trust what's familiar and be suspicious of what's unfamiliar. It's a basic survival instinct that's helped keep us safe for thousands of years. We unconsciously sort things into familiar versus unfamiliar, same versus different, them versus us. Here's a test. How do you feel about people who own a handgun? Don't attend church. Vote for the other candidate. Are on welfare. Don't eat meat. Have tattoos. Don't believe in marriage. Drive an electric car. Didn't go to college. Don't speak English. Curse. Are over six. Are disabled. Drive the speed limit. Love cats. Love dogs. Can you feel your brain sorting people into groups? Was there a little them versus us happening? It can happen unconsciously. Okay, so um, I'm guessing that as you were hearing those buzzwords, uh, you were probably immediately coming to some conclusions. You have some beliefs about some of those topics, demographics, or people that were being mentioned. Uh, so yeah, so I think when you're doing that, that is a recognition, or at least it should be, that system one is in play. Uh, we have baked in beliefs about everyone that we come into contact with based on all of our prior experiences about that person uh, or that group. So it is just a fact that everybody on this Zoom session has those biases. There's no shame in this. Um, bias does not equal racism or prejudice. It's the opposite. Acknowledging and recognizing those bias allow us to protect ourselves from engaging in prejudicial or discriminatory behavior. So the first step here is to just acknowledge that they're there. Um, it is natural for us to organize and simplify a complicated world by trying to find patterns and by categorizing things. 
So we're, we're going to continue to thrust at this idea that for this topic, when it comes to discussions about race equity, we really have to push back against that automatic categorization that allows us to move faster through other topics, because for this one, it's really destructive. Um, so the next piece of this is that the best way to change someone else's mind is to demonstrate a willingness to change your own. Uh, this is just really important. If we go into these conversations with the intent of everyone agreeing with us, we're never going to get anywhere. Uh, system one driven conversations just don't allow for new ideas. Uh, so we're going to run into walls if we continue to have this discussion and system one responses. I wanna talk about a couple of thinking errors that Danny Kahneman has identified that system one um, drives. We, I think you'll have access to this. So if you wanna go through all these, you can. I wanna hone in on just one for today and that's attribute substitution. Uh, we have a tendency to just not deal with complicated things sometimes. So if we come across the complex situation, we tend to attribute um, a different, more simple problem there. And then we just substitute the answer for the simpler problem into that space. So in, in this discussion, one example would be something like um, the question of to what extent is racism still present and impactful in the United States? That's a really complex question. It's really difficult to get into. There's a whole bunch of nuance. So instead of doing the homework uh, and really getting into that question, um, sometimes we can just bypass it and go to something simpler and say something like a non-Caucasian president was elected in 2008. So therefore, <laughs> we're not racist or racism doesn't, has an, doesn't have an impact. So uh, I think the caution here is to not shortcut and to not jump ahead because it actually does require us to do the real deep work here. That was one example in a sea of thousands. Um, so I want to transition here to, to really drive this point home to a, a clip of someone who was forced to deal with his system one responses in a way that you can tell is really impactful for him. And I will warn that this video is a bit uncomfortable to watch. Uh, the backdrop here, if you haven't seen this Netflix special, uh, Darren Brown produces this, directs it. Um, he creates this scenario where this person who has expressed some really bigoted views um, actually thinks that they are testing a neural implant app. And there he's actually in an experiment to figure out if there are ways to change that view that he holds about people, uh, but he doesn't know that. So um, the impact of this, you're going to watch in real time, someone's system one response um, run headlong into being forced to deal with that same response in a system two way. So his automatic response, he gets forced to deal with this. Uh, so we're gonna watch this and then we're gonna talk about it. Uh, it's pretty powerful. So I wanna linger here for a minute before I turn this back over to Vlad. Uh, we've obviously kind of sped up to this point. I know we've tried to push a lot into that first 20, 25 minutes, um, but I really wanna linger here for just a second and, and talk about um, some of the things that this clip really, I think highlights. Um, the first, I have kind of two minds when I see this. And the first is optimism uh, because it, it shows that it's possible to rewire ourselves in this way, um, to just reframe the way that we see the world, uh, including when it's really embedded and deeply embedded. Uh, so I think that's that's really, uh, it's helpful and it's optimistic. Uh, it makes, it gives me hope that this is possible. Uh, the other piece of my mind here though is concerned uh, because we don't have the time and resources to manufacture this moment for everyone. Um, the amount of energy and effort it took to bring this to light for this person uh, can't be recreated on scale for us. And this moment is resting in all of us somewhere, uh, maybe not on the same issue and maybe not to the same intensity, but it's there. And it's there in a way that is having an impact. Um, so I think the work for us is to find a way to manufacture that moment for ourselves, to do the work necessary, uh, to figure out where those points are for us, those pressure points where we're just operating on autopilot and it's causing us to judge people, to not give people a chance, to not treat people fairly and to not push for equality generally. Um, you can see it in him. Uh, most of the people that I've watched this clip with or done in training, um, they have a lot of disdain for this guy initially. Um, and maybe they hold that, but what becomes pretty clear pretty quickly 
is that he is a product of his environment too. Um, these are beliefs that he had given to him that are now coming out of him in ways that he's never questioned. So simple heuristics can really be destructive here. Um, consider like something like what your automatic thought is when you hear a white police officer shot an unarmed black man. Most people, I think, land on a belief about that. And then that belief stays no matter what the information thereafter ends up being. And so we're just kind of stuck in this space where we're talking past each other. Um, and the reality is, is that we owe it to each other to dig deeper and to really figure out where we lie in these places and where some of these gut reactions are coming from. Uh, because I don't know that we're going to be able to get anywhere if we continue to just hold on to what that original belief is without any willingness to let go of it. Uh, and I think that's really important for people who have lived in a space, whatever the context is, where there has been a benefit or a privilege or you've been in the majority, uh, because it's always going to feel like that that's just the way that it is and the way that it's supposed to be. Uh, so it doesn't feel like a benefit if you've always had it. So I think it really just does take us doing the legwork here and stepping back. And hopefully uh, we don't have that moment exposed for us in a similar way. Um, hopefully we can do the work ourselves to find it first because it is coming for most of us if we don't do that work. That or we isolate ourselves in a way where we just never come into contact with anybody who's different than us, which I don't know is a, is a great solution to the challenge that we face either. So uh, I think if, if you take anything away from this, it is that that moment is there. It is there, it's waiting. And our work is to try to go find it. So with that backdrop, I'm gonna turn it over to Vlad uh, and he's going to take us home. Okay, so following up with Barry and basically taking notes and shortcuts, this illustration uh, takes place after the George Floyd murder. And the famous illustration, oh, uh, within this illustration, we are seeing um, how our ability to, how our unchecked bias can drastically impact our ability to remain objective in the way we view the world. So um, as you guys can see, this the male character is having these visceral reactions to his friend's um, comments, right? She's not seeing that the issue at hand is unfair bias is impacting her way of seeing what really happened in this situation with George Floyd. And it was not until the friend passionately called her out that she had a reaction, that that light clicked on. And oh, wait, what? I am, I'm, what do you mean my thoughts are basically making me sound like a racist? So there are three, um, there are about 150 biases out there. Uh, for the sake of time, obviously, I'm only gonna focus on three. Um, affinity bias, confirmation bias, and perception bias. And affinity bias is basically our, it, it's the self-reflection, like this uh, illustration is showing, it's the self-reflection, right? The, I connect with someone that shares my same values, my beliefs. Um, in a workplace, it looks like, this is a perfect example, because this ha has happened to me, of observing a coworker who may not have had the levels of qual um, qualifications as I did, but his connections or way of connecting was that closer to my supervisor. Um, okay, so, um, and what it looks like for even parenthood is that you favor um, a specific child because you connect with them more, right? So a confirmation bias is basically what this illustration is showing, right? We are somewhere in the middle between our objective, uh, the facts, and what we are trying to see in the world, right? So we are actively seeking out information that solidifies our beliefs or pre-existing beliefs. Um, example would be if I believed in a specific stereotype or judgment pertaining to a specific group, and I am actively finding either news um, coverage or um, a social media platform that specifically targets that culture or, or group that basically confirms my belief, right? So uh, a, a specific uh, um, media outlet. Um, perception bias is basically how the our tendency to make simplistic assumptions um, and stereotypes pertaining to a group, 
right? It's how we think we see the world. Do we see the world or like in this illustration, do we see the old, um, um, the older woman or the young girl, right? Um, our perception, if not checked, can just like in the um, earlier video of um, the, the man who basically learned about himself by doing that genetic test and his perception was changed because he was forced in a, in a compassionate way to challenge his pre-existing thoughts. So how does this play in the workplace? With unchecked bias, um, it impacts um, promotion decisions, work assignments, career, career tracks. So going back to that affinity bias, so propelling an employee who may not deserve it compared uh, outside someone else who may because you have a stronger connection with that person, you favor them. Harassments, one of the two things I always hear when I have racial conversations with my white friends is that I do not wanna have this conversation because I'm not equipped and I, I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing or I'm afraid that I will get in trouble with HR. And I always respond of, and we'll get into this of like creating a safe um, and brave space, but if you do not allow yourself to have the opportunity to seek opposing viewpoints, then how can you effectively create change? Also work culture, discrimination lawsuit, diverse talent recruitment. One of the fascinating and amazing things we're doing right now at Truman, I'm part of our workforce recruitment committee and we are actively doing our due diligence to continue to make sure that we are, our workforce represents the culture and population that we serve. That is very, very important to us. So we are basically sending um, brochures to um, historical black colleges, um, schools within the urban core to let them know about behavioral health, but also to like focus on our community to let them know that we are representing as much as possible. Work productivity. So we talked about the kinetics um, in, in the kind of like the framework. Now we're gonna talk about the, like skill acquisition. So what is in your toolbox? What can you do, right? So phasing out unconscious bias, um, broke it down into two phases. So know thyself and person-centered. So know thyself, there is the uh, Harvard Implicit Bias Test, which I encourage people to take if you have not done so yet. Um, and what I want to talk about specifically with this is that it is not a test that's designed to shame or place judgment. It is a test designed to allow you to know where you are on the map of <laughs> un unchecked bias. Um, as we mentioned earlier, everyone has bias, right? This is because of our natural human tendency to organize and simplify our very chaotic world. <laughs> we, we, we do this by finding patterns, um, shortcuts, if you will, and, um, and, and, and grouping, right? So the thing about bias is that it, it's, shaped by our, our, it, it's shaped by our bad, and good, it's shaped by our experiences. And we have to do the work in order to basically rewire what we think we know about the world. And that will not happen if we do not, again, do the work um, individually and together because it does not take one person. It, it takes a, a system to create the change, right? But it has to start with the individual. So we have to do the work together, together um, to put procedures and practices into place to limit how our unchecked bias can impact us on a magnitude, uh, on a grand level. Be aware of your initial thoughts about people and upon what those thoughts are truly based on, right? Fact check. <laughs> so if you make a decision, know where that's coming from. Um, next time you make a statement about someone, ask yourself, what are the facts? Where is this coming from? Is this coming from a, a a perceived thought I have, or am I actively doing my work to look at other um, facts that's coming from this, or sources, sorry. Um, so we talked about um, knowing ourself, um, person-centered, now setting up safe and brave spaces. This is key and paramount because we cannot get into a conversation with someone and not create the environment that allows us to do so. so 
make sure the person has the time and space for the conversation. There is a thing of, um, about emotional labor. Um, I myself have, have experienced this as a black male of just people coming up to me and asking me all these questions about racism. Like this has now been a thing because George Floyd died. This has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is now not, this is not new. So it, it has been, and I have checked myself about this. So if you go to someone that is outside of your culture and you want to learn, make sure that they're ready for it. Don't make the assumption that they are. Um, intentionally create space to ask any questions and process through your answers. So before that conversation starts, set some, set some expectations, right? Um, I wanna learn from you, I wanna grow today, um, and I want for you to learn from me. At, at Truman, we, whenever we onboard people, we always focus on how to connect with clients. Engagement, right? So listen empathetically. That means you're not checking your phone. You're not kind of wandering off into space or daydreaming. You are actively looking at that person as if they are the only person in the world that matters in that moment, right? Um, if called out, pause to center your feelings and lean in. This is not about being comfortable. This is about being uncomfortable. That is, if you if you are sitting with someone and it's a very comfortable conversation, something is not happening. It has to be. You have to expand your 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 realm. For example, when after George Floyd uh, murder happened, I for that week, I was angry, mad. I had a ton of negative feelings. Um, my wife actually encouraged me to find someone that I can talk to. And the first person I thought of was a, a friend of mine who is a police officer. And I reached out to him because um, I felt safe with him. We've had conversations in the past. So I reached out to him and we, I went over to his house. We had, we had bourbon in a conversation and it was the best hour, actually two, two hours <laughs> I spent with someone. Because in, in this world, if we are going to, the research suggests that if we are wanting to change, we can change our unconscious beliefs, we have to um, surround ourselves with opposing viewpoints. And he was a police officer, there was a, that was a big opposing viewpoint. And he helped me to understand the other uh, side of the story. He disagreed with the tactics and taught me the appropriate procedure that those officers should have taken. If I did not meet with him, I would not have learned that. And person-centered, um, phase two, oops. So looking for the commonalities that exist, regardless of race, religion, and gender. Um, again, surround yourself with a diverse mixed culture and social situations and individuals, right? And I love this last line. Um, we see the world differently if we take the time to replace our pre-existing lens. I will leave you with a quote. Um, it, confrontations, I'm sorry, compassion without confrontation uh, quickly fades into uh, fruitless sentimental um, commiseration. I actually slightly disagree with that. And I've been focusing on how I would word it differently. And I think compassion without engagement, right? We can, I'm compassionate, Jared's compassionate, and we have engaged through this dynamic and it has been an amazing experience. However, if I did not engage and he didn't challenge me, I didn't challenge him, this would not have been organic. So I think we have to have compassion and lean in, engage, right? And connect. And the last thing we'll leave you with is this really awesome quote from Chase Baldwin. Um, not, every, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Yeah, and I would just, I would add um, the last piece here. Um, the last code word is forward, go forward. Uh, and just in the process of putting this together, so I mentioned that coming to grips with some of those bias that rest in all of us, just working with Glenn and creating this content I've had an infinite number of those moments uh, because there's just no way to have this dialogue without realizing that we've, we've had different experiences. And so we're going to see things in ways that I'm completely blind to until I hear someone else who's experienced say, well, here's what that meant to me. Uh, so I suggest the process of creating this. Uh, we have experienced this exact same concept. And I think, I know I'm definitely better for just the process of putting together an hour long workshop um, and having discussions around these issues with somebody who is experiencing the world in different ways on some of these some of these areas. So just that process for me, um, I've lived this again, just in the last month.
And I think with that, um, question. Yeah, that's my. If you do have questions about this specifically, or we do have an extended version, uh, because this is obviously a lot really quickly, um, we really, I think our interest is getting into the meta of this and really getting into or helping foster some of those conversations. Uh, if you have interest, there's the contact information. Otherwise, uh, we will um, shut up and take some <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Vladimir and Jared. That was an incredible presentation. I actually learned a lot from that. So thank you so much for uh, taking your time to be here today and for educating us all on these really important, you know, issues oh, thank you. and dynamics. Um, could you do me a favor and please repeat the code words again? Yes. Uh, so the code words are together forward. and forward or forward together. All right. Um, so one of the questions is that was brought up was um, are there any additional books or activities in the Kansas City area that we can engage to learn more about e racial equality? Yeah, who wants to go first? Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so as far as in books, um, I was a big fan of um, How to Be a, a Anti-Racist by, I believe, Kendi. I always mess up his name. Um, it's, it's a child-friendly book. There's an adult version. Um, but it's a child-friendly book. There's illustrations in there. Um, however, it's designed, the wording in it is more designed for uh, designed for an adult. Um, there are, there's, I'm, I'm really big into kid books, sorry, <laughs> child therapist. Um, there's uh, In My Skin, um, which is another great book about um, uh, a, a biracial child. Um, there's Mix Like Me, which is a really cool one. Um, for other uh, biracial children. Um, what about any activities in the Kansas City area? Can, is there anything you would recommend for us, uh, like for someone that is learning a lot more about this subject and this topic and trying to become more aware and like culturally sensitive and in all aspects, is there any uh, activities or any uh, engagement opportunities you would advise? Yeah. So. Um, I am a big fan of in vivo experience. So if you do not want to leave your house, you can also do this by using Google Maps. Um, 18th and Vine has a very historic, um, it's, a very, it's a historic district. And you can easily go to Google Maps, type in 18th and Vine and take a scroll through that area. But there's the 18th, uh, not 18th, but the Jazz Museum uh, and the Negro League Museum. They're tied in the same, they're both in the same building. But that is a rich area of, finding um, historically uh, black experiences that will give you more of a culture, well, specifically about Kansas City. Um, I can't think of any other activities outside of that or any, any upcoming events outside of that. Yeah, I think I, I know um, somebody who, um, older gentleman, he and his wife, um, just uh, they take their bikes and they go to a new neighborhood uh, that they haven't been in and they ride around all day and that's how they spend a Saturday or Sunday and they talk to everybody who's outside um, and they do this all over the city. They do it in the Northeast, they do it East of Troost, uh, they do it West of Troost and that just listening to him share that experience, uh, connecting with people all over the city. Um, again, he's not, he's not being abrasive, he's not door knocking, um, people are outside and he's just having a conversation with people. And the, the kind of the contemporaneous interactions that he ends up having, including just random lunches with random people and picnics and like friendships. I mean, he's just, it's, it's a really simple and organic way um, to expose yourself to where different people are living and what their experiences may be like. So um, I, he, I ran into him the other day and he shared that that's what he does. And that just seemed like a really cool, simple way uh, to take a first step. So another question that was brought up is, what is the best way to recognize our biases on the regular? Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, I, I really, I really think it's like keeping it in like front and center, um, it, it, and realize that there's not a destination. Mm. It's always going to be there, and that there's no shame in constantly practicing that exercise. I know for me, the number one thing that I look for in myself is defensiveness. Whenever I feel that defensiveness about anything, uh, it's an indication for me that there's work to do there. 
um, either a, a personal perception I have about myself or about somebody else. If I feel myself getting defensive, I think reframing that as a cue to dig deeper as opposed to what we usually do, which is attack or run away. Uh, I think in that space, when it's safe, uh, leaning into that defensiveness and really getting into why did that just cause that reaction for me? Yes, why am I not comfortable just being in that space? Um, the defensiveness for me is the emotion that's the trigger. And for me, it's the finding opposing viewpoints. Like, again, going back to my officer friend, I, there, there's been times where I get stuck in what I think is right, right? And I and I do my own confirmation bias. I will seek out <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, videos on YouTube that's a, that I know has to do against uh, a, a, um, a wing that I don't like. And I, and I tried my best, or I am trying, I have to constantly do that, of finding new information to give me some uh, different answers outside of what I think I know. Well, that's great. That was one of our questions is, this feels really uncomfortable for me oh, to yeah. talk it's about. Oh yeah, always gotta be uncomfortable. And Lean how, in. how yes. do you overcome that? And I love that, leaning into the discomfort, right? Um, surrounding ourselves with, with opposing viewpoints, um, having compassion and engagement allowing that opportunity for that safe and brave space. I just think that those are such key like points that we can all take away from this. Um, there was one other, a few other questions here. Um, can you give us some examples of how to engage in these approaches in the workplace? Oh, okay. So how to engage in the workplace? Uh, I think individually we have to be okay with sitting down unable to address that client because of fear destroying the alliance, right? The, the therapeutic alliance in a sense. And the client made a comment about, um, I don't understand these riots, uh, just negative rhetoric about just Black Lives Matter. And my uh, staff obviously is of the um, uh, BIPOC or, or diverse uh, community. And she was unable to like tackle that. So. I think when we are faced in the workforce with something that offends us, we should be brave and step in to whomever um, has said something and just say, hey, look, um, this came up. Do you have the space in order to sit down with me so we can talk about this? I would really appreciate it. Um, and I think it needs to start there. Now we need to manage our own expectations. This person may not be at that spot. Like Jared was even saying, the walls may come up like, oh my God, no, I'm not a racist. I have a black brand. What are you talking about? <laughs> but even if they're not ready, then we have to sit with that too. Yeah. 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 I think a, a simple principle is to engage there is assuming positive intent always. Uh, because even if you're wrong about that, there's no penalty in having assumed it. But if you don't assume it, there's no starting point. Uh, the vast, vast majority of these discussions, it really is just a lack of shared experience. And the more that we can have that conversation, the closer we get to understanding um, that that experience is different. Not necessarily understanding the experience, but understanding that it's different. And that alone is enough to engage. So uh, assuming positive intent really is, I think, a starting point here. Um, because it just, there's no, that defensiveness is less likely to come up. If you're engaging as a, a conversation and you're just inquisitive and wanting to get a sense of where this is coming from, because then it's an opportunity to do what Vlad just said, which is explain impact. Here's how that landed for me. Uh, and the other piece I would add on the workplace side is, for me anyway, I got a lot of success in just framing this first within the context of the impact that it's having at work. This isn't just a thing that can be isolated to the general public. And then when you come to work, it's gone until you leave. It's impacting work. It's impacting the way clients are engaging you. It's impacting the way you're engaging clients. And so tying it back to that lens, now it's just best practice. Mm -hmm. And now it's not this, this thing that has to be treated differently than everything else that we put in the bucket of best practice. In some real sense, it is just a piece of trauma-informed care. Um, so if you can get on board with trauma-informed care, you, get on board you should get on board with full inclusion <laughs> because they are the same thing. Uh, one is a, a big subset of the other. Lovely. And our last question for today is, has current social context changed our approach? Oh, man. Wow. Current social context? 
change our approach of how we manage racial conversations? I think it's exposed our approach. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's exposed our approach more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. I think. Oh, yeah. No, you no, know, I think Jared is right. Like, I think it's, it, it, it has given, this has, obviously, as I said earlier, this has been going on for a very long time. I think current context has given more fuel to this, right? It has like pushed the agenda more of like conversations like this, um, more TED Talks, uh, more exposure of, of a systematic problem that has been here, that has been baked in America. I, I once heard someone say how racism is like butter and America is like the cake. Like it's, it's been, <laughs> it's embedded. It, it, it's just, we can't remove the butter. We have, so we have to constantly keep continuing these brave talks and conversations. And I and I hope that this does not stop at the end of this year, that this keeps going. Um, and that's what we've already stopped. But yeah, I, sorry, that was a response. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, just <laughs> I just appreciate hearing that this is not easy. This is difficult. Mm -hmm. This is really hard. But I think being brave and finding that safe place to be able to have these discussions, I think is so powerful. So thank you guys so much for your incredible presentations. Um, our next presentation will begin at 1015. And now is your time to practice some self-care. We'll see y'all soon. Thank you.